In her search for an undetermined beginning time, Albers would interrogate the origins of the weaving process itself. As she um, described beginning, beginning, she said, means exploration, selection, development, a potent vitality not circumscribed by the tried and the traditional. I try to take my students on this journey back into early time to the beginnings of textiles. In late 1933, Annie and Joseph Albers emigrated to Black Mountain College, North Carolina. In December 1935, they traveled to Mexico on the first of 14 trips they would make over the next three decades, mostly to Mexico, but also to Chile and Peru. Their last journey would be in 1967. Mexico had its own turbulent entry into the 20th century, a violent and bloody revolution from 1910 to 1920. The aftermath continued into the early 1930s. By 1936, however, a fragile stability had been restored and Mexico City had grown to be a large sprawling cosmopolitan metropolis with a population of over 1 million. The Alvarez's first visit, first five visits to Mexico um, between 1935 and 1940 coincided with the election and regime of President Lazaro Cardenas in 1934. which was a more peaceful period in Mexico's history. In Mexico City, Annie and Joseph made their first direct contact with the art of Mesoamerica. They were fascinated equally by the colonial Baroque architecture, by contemporary art and folk art. But what drew them most was the pre-conquest art and architecture, which they saw first in uh, museums. And here is an early photograph of the display in Mexico's uh, Museum of Ethnography. Their very first experience of this art had of course been in Berlin's Museum of Ethnology in the 1920s. Just as they had found there in Berlin in 19, just as they had found in Berlin in 1936, the collections of Mexico's National Museum were cluttered and disorganized. Uh, and you can see here in the background these glass cases, some pieces out of cases, some roughly arranged in cases. And these are all photographs that Joseph took, Joseph Alvarez took at the time. Um, Annie welcomed the disorder that freed her to explore the objects for their formal qualities. She was less interested in the labels and the where these what these works were and where they came from uh, than what they conveyed to her um, formally. The pieces were simply placed side by side in old fashioned glass cases, often crowded together. They were regarded merely as specimens. It was a challenge to our observation, she later wrote. While Joseph spent days photographing objects, she took note of the visual sophistication of their design and began to reform her ideas about weaving. Almost immediately, Joseph and Annie began their own collection of these objects that were readily available from street vendors in the 1930s. Later, they would purchase items from local dealers as well as from dealers in the United States and even in Germany. And by the late 1960s, they had a collection of pre-Columbian, pre-conquest articles that numbered 1,400. And there we see them in 1935 outside, uh, probably outside one of the um, archaeological sites with their friends, uh, the dryers on the left, and there's Annie on a chair um, looking for objects. And as you can see, many of these things were broken and were simply shards, they looked for very small but very complete um, objects which they collected. 
Over the years, on their visits to Mexico, Annie and Joseph crisscrossed the vast country, traveling by train and by car. Um, in this talk, I'll focus on the state of Oaxaca and specifically the site of Monte Alban as emblematic of their overall experience um, in Mexico. Monte Alban was best known for its Zapotec art and architecture that dated from 500 BC to about 800 AD. Um, here we see a photograph taken by a German archaeologist in the late 19th century, 1895, in fact. Um, and here, the same site uh, in 2005. So um, whereas here the architecture, the ancient uh, buildings remain completely hidden underground um, here by 2005. Um, of course, they have become a very uh, almost manicured um, tourist site. Uh, Although the excavations in other parts of Mexico had begun in the 19th century, excavations at Monte Alban, led by archaeologist Alfonso Caso, started much later in 1931 and continued into the 1950s. When Annie and Joseph first visited Monte Alban in January 1935, they walked right into Caso's ongoing excavations and you can see his um, these little huts and things that the archaeologists had set up right in the background and the top right. Um, and they were immediately transported back 1500 years in time. They immediately responded to the beauty and the geometry of the architecture. And this is the ball court um, uh, at uh, Monte Alban in 1935. Annie would later attribute the ongoing chaos of collapse, as she described it, in contemporary Europe to an excess of civilization that led to a loss of connection with reality. In her words, civilization spoils us for direct receptivity. Layer upon layer of civilized life has veiled our directness of seeing. We often look for the meaning of things while the thing itself is the meaning. Her quest for authenticity, for directness, would be answered by her encounter with direct evidence of the past. What was more, at Monte Alban in 1935, she was now a participant in the gradual uncovering of this evidence which was not to be found in a museum, but was being revealed before her own eyes. Annie and Joseph returned to Monte Alban on every subsequent visit from 1936 to 1952. And each visit brought new revelations as the site transformed gradually into a vast showcase of the pre-conquest past. Annie's interest lay not only in the textiles, but in the machines that produced them. In Mexico, she found local weavers working on modern versions of ancient backstrap looms. She mastered their techniques and had her students at Black Mountain College do the same on looms that they made themselves. And here we see them uh, a little later, uh, sitting outside getting suntan and having their weaving class. Visiting Zachila, a Zapotec village near Monte Alban, she wrote admiringly of the local indigenous inhabitants whose material poverty she evoked, whose material poverty evoked in her the spiritual richness of an earlier time. Monte Alban's spectacular elevated location in a lush mountainscape with 360 degree panoramic views of the Valley of Oaxaca had been selected centuries earlier by the leaders of the Zapotec nation. And Annie Alves was eager to honor both the people and the site in her work. 
I have made a sketch for a weaving and I'm happy with it. I think it could be beautiful, she wrote to her friend Ted Dreyer in July 1936. I want to make more, more sketches so I can produce a few good things next year. The result was this magnificent wall hanging, Monte Alban, a restrained and monumental piece in which the underlying geometry of her Bauhaus weavings, the uh, central gray black band and the side panels of um, white and beige, that geometry was overlaid with what we see now as a linear network of supplementary or floating wefts, a technique common in the Andes that described a subtle emerging outline of the Monte Alban site. And uh, um, we can see it, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but we see these lines going through it and then looking at a detail, we see how she has taken these floating wefts and woven them into the fabric of the body of the textile in order to create this outline of uh, the site as she uh, recalled it. At about the same time, in a modern acknowledgement of her Andean textile forebears, she created the dramatic black and gold textile ancient writing with its inlaid grids of imagined texts. Here again, she used floating or supplementary wefts, now with increasing complexity, to write within and across the solid black surface, breaking it up with the ghosts of embedded meanings. And again, we can see this in uh, great de greater detail here. Whereas Annie had been thrilled by the creative energy of her direct contact with Mexico, she had not found a highly developed early textile culture there, since the tropical climate of Mesoamerica did not allow the preservation of textiles, as was the case in the cooler and exceptionally dry southern part of the continent. Although she would not travel to Peru and Chile until 1953, she studied Andean societies and their material cultures, not only in museums, but after her move to New Haven in the fall of 1950, in the courses of leading Yale anthropologist Wendell Bennett and art historian George Kubler, and from archaeologist Junius Bird at the Museum of Natural History in New York. After 1960, she would attend the classes of Yale Mexico specialist Michael Coe. Ancient writing was a tribute to the Andean cultures of Peru, Chile and Bolivia, where although a written system of the Quechua language had been devised in the 16th century, writing did not become part of indigenous life. The first and possibly only written grammar of Quechua was published after the Spanish conquest by a Dominican priest who arrived in Peru in, 19, in 1538. Today, Quechua, along with Aymara and Maya other minor indigenous languages remains essentially a spoken language. So we see how she understood um, the writing of the ancients um, as something symbolic and not something written in the way that we understand languages to be written. For Annie Alvis, it was this absence of a written language that provoked one of the highest textile cultures invested in communicating through textiles with the expressive directness that she valued so much. A fabric, she wrote, can be great art only if it retains directness of communication. Alvis's insistence on expressive directness was her recognition of medium specificity. The meaning of a fabric is the fabric itself, the visual reading of its structure. This idea introduced at the Bauhaus and elaborated through her study of Andean textiles is a key to all of her work. It wasn't only that the Andean weavers had no written language, but that their visual language developed over centuries 
was especially sophisticated and encoded in the structures of their textiles. Over time, the coded language became internalized in society. Weaving was a social group activity involving the whole community. The textiles were surfaces for communication. The patterns on Inca tunics, with their different levels of complexity, for example, denoted positions of power in society, with the plainest checkerboard packet patterns, as you see on the left, being worn by foot soldiers, and the most complex on the right, by royalty. The Andean weavers lived alongside their domesticated camelid animal, animals, the, the llamas, alpacas, guanacos, and vicuñas that they uh, uh, had domesticated. And these animals served not only for transportation and food, but from their fur, the Andeans spun their yarns. And here uh, in this wonderful photograph taken by John Cohen in 1954, we see a group of Andean weavers, women uh, in Peru, walking along alongside their animals, uh, a little child in the background, and they're actually spinning and winding their yarn in their hands as they walk through the streets. The weavers also fabricated their own looms on which the great masterworks, in Annie's words, on which the great masterworks of their textile art were woven. Unlike traditional European textile teaching methods that began with planning patterns on paper, the Andean weavers do not use notation systems. The patterns are construct constructed in modular, rectangular, or square units that are directly related to the vertical, horizontal structure of the loom. And here again, in uh, photographs, we can see on the left um, a young woman counting out and measuring uh, her patterns and that she will then go on to weave as she moves along the textile. And on the right, uh, the spinning of that, uh, the, the fur from the, the animals uh, being, taking place, um, as you see here. Within this grid system, the Andean weavers invented an astonishing repertoire of techniques that could, that could transmit a diversity of messages through the creation of systems of standardized conventional signs, symbolic images that overcame linguistic barriers. And so here in this uh, fragment uh, that belonged to part of Annie Alves's collection, and we can see certain things. This is a slit weaving. And notice how these figures are uh, all situated within the grid pattern. Um, and each one was recognizable, could be read um, by the, uh, the people in the community. And here you can see how these slits have actually been stitched together. Uh, so we see this in great uh, detail. Annie adopted these working methods in her own work. And we can see here in these examples how the structures increase in complexity, but the underlying grid remains. It always, it is always visible. In the work on the left, black, white, and gray from the Bauhaus period, it's uh, more uh, simplified, if you like. And then when under the influence of the Andean weaving and what she was learning about that, she begins to uh, create these far more complex patterns. And uh, we can still see how the squares, the, the horizontals and verticals of the grid are now broken up, but they're still there. They're still very much visible um, within, uh, within the uh, the overall structure. So we can almost pick out little phrases, if you like, of, uh, of different, um, different pieces of this wonderful work, which she called, tellingly, open letter. In other words, um, it was a, uh, a, 
communication and uh, it was open and you could read it if you went across with your eyes you saw it visually uh, the thing itself was its meaning um, so here in, in her modern way she is actually adopting the patterns that she found uh, in these pre-Columbian weavings and all of these uh, images that I'm showing you are from her own collection, which she regarded as a source of study, as a source of learning for herself, rather than as um, objects to uh, simply be admired. She wanted to understand them, she wanted to be able to read them, and she wanted to be able, her, she wanted her audience to be able to read her weavings in this same visual way. There's a detail. And here we can see um, on the left a detail of um, open letter and um, making visible that sort of uh, block structure where each section is a paragraph, if you like, or a sentence or a phrase. And um, she, she did this in so many different ways, varying the colors, varying the actual uh, weave techniques, often inventing based on the openwork techniques of the Peruvian weavers, inventing her own language of weaving, which would be perceived visually. A wide range of structural diversity can thus be achieved through the intrinsic vertical horizontal grid of the loom, and we can read these structures. And this is where the meaning of her work lies. Annie Alves' seminal text on weaving was published in 1965. It is a reflection on and an interrogation of her life as a weaver and her accumulated knowledge of her medium. It was famously dedicated to my great teachers, the weavers of ancient Peru, who constructed fabrics that stand up, that stand as a testimonial to the heights of inventiveness in weaving never reached again anywhere at any time. She was completely outspoken and convinced of that. Um, after 800 years, she wrote, we still deal in weaving as at the time of its beginning. Sorry, after 8,000 years, I think I said 800. After 8,000 years, she wrote, we still deal in weaving as at the time of its beginning with a rigid set of parallel threads in tension and a mobile one that traverses it at right angles. For Annie Alvers, weaving brought stability, balance and order, validated in the eternal crossing of vertical and horizontal threads in hundreds of her textile constructions for half a century. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. That was so beautiful. It's I, so I'm not quite sure how to turn this off. So I'll oh, just press stop share. Okay. And um, yeah, okay. it's just wonderful to um, see the indigenous origins of modernism through Annie's work. So beautiful journey for us to go into her trips and archives with you. Thank you so much. And I'm sure if anybody's ever interested in um, doing research on the Alba's work, they can make an appointment to come and see the foundation in New Haven. Soon, soon. as soon as we... Soon, we not we, yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> but soon, yeah, when right. we stop doing this kind of thing and we can actually yeah. talk to each other directly. Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you so much. And thanks again for this opportunity. No, no, thank you for joining us.